Uh, tomorrow on the show, we're going to have Ted DiBiase, who is the answer of, to a very interesting trivia question. Uh, he was supposed to be, he's the only man who was supposed to win th three of the four major world titles of, of his, uh, during, during the time he was an active wrestler. And except for about one week defending the WF title that he never won, he never got any of them. <laughs> so we can, we can talk about a man who came almost close to, uh, whatever would count as immortality in this business. Hey, he still had a hell of a career. And uh, we can talk about that. Not about today's wrestling with Ted DiBiase, because, as everyone knows, he doesn't watch it. And uh, Friday, we've got Gene Kaniski. So that should be. Gene Kaniski was uh, uh, one of the top three or four wrestlers of the 1960s. And Pretty sure he lives around here. What? I think he lives around here. Uh, either Vancouver, BC, or Blaine, Washington. Yeah, I think it's Blaine. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... How, how did you ever? Did you ever hear about Gene Kaniski like at independent shows? They ever actually. Like, you know what? Story? I think he came to one of our shows about three years ago. Really? Yep. Did they ever talk about him, or is he too far back? You know, like where the old timers and stuff. The old timers talk about him. Yeah. You know, none of the new guys wouldn't know the name, but you know. Well, yeah, they wouldn't. I mean, you know, he stopped wrestling. You know, probably early '80s, I would think. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, his career had pretty much wound down. I mean, I I saw, I mean, I saw Gene Kaniski in the '70s, and he would have been in his. Let's see. I'm, I'm figuring, um, just trying to figure Kaniski's age. Um, he would have been about in his late 40s when I saw him first. And he was a hell of a worker. I mean, I mean, like, when, you know, I remember seeing him in, in Hawaii. The first time I ever saw him live was in Hawaii. And, I mean, he was, you know, he was one of those guys where you go to a live show. And, I mean, this was, you know, this was a card with, with a lot of big names. I mean, Hawaii in, in the early 70s had, had you know, most of the AWA guys, so it had very good wrestling. And he, you know, stood out. Like when you watched him, it was sort of like, you know, watching, you know, watching a guy who was a step above everyone else. And then I remember one time he came into San Francisco. This is late seventies for a battle royal, and he, you know, he had to be, he had to be right around fifty, fifty one, and looked, and looked every bit of it, maybe even older than that. And you see this old guy, and and what a worker he was. He was like the third or fourth best guy in the battle royal, and that's you know something, you know, he's running around with the funks and 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 people like that that were the big stars of that era. So, so it almost makes like me wonder. Like they had that stupid evening gown match at the pay per view, and I was thinking, you know, if they put Pat Patterson, Gerald Briscoe in the ring and had him do a short wrestling match, imagine what it looked like in comparison. Oh, well, Pat Patterson for about ninety seconds can still go because I've seen those little clips of him and stuff. Because um, he throws those great punches and he and he, and he knows how to sell. Um, Briscoe. I don't know. Gerald, Gerald Briscoe was never a great wrestler. I mean, he was, he was all right. I mean, he was good, I guess. But I mean, uh, what I remember about the Briscoe brothers was, you know, when Jack tagged in, it was like all action. And when Jerry was in, it was, you know, wasn't bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Jack Jack Briscoe was an awesome wrestler. Kaniski, there was something about what was another, another Kaniski thing that I remember. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Gene Kaniski, Gene Kaniski. This is the famous match with Baba. I remember when when Baba died, and, and they kept showing the clips of the match with Gene Kaniski and Baba, which was from a baseball stadium show in the. It's probably like sixty five, sixty six, Osaka baseball stadium, and they were out there for like seventy minutes, sixty five minutes. I mean, it was an hour and then an overtime, and I'm just watching this, and it's like it wouldn't really hold up because like t today because Kaniski didn't have. The weightlifter's bodybuilder's body, if you know what I mean. He kind of just looked like a big guy who was a football player that didn't lift weights, you know, that kind of a look. Yeah. But, I mean, and the work wasn't the spectacular flying around. But, I mean, when he hit guys, I mean, you could hear, you know, it, it was a very realistic style of wrestling, I guess. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, speaking of which, we're talking about Gene Kinnist. we got got um, Don Morocco, and we were talking about Hawaii, who grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, and, and actually, as a kid, may have watched Gene Kinnist. Is that is that is that possible, Don? Yeah, real possible. Yeah, he used to come um, over here all the time. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm late. No, no, no problem, no problem. Don, I, I want to introduce you for newer fans. Don Morocco was uh, one of the top stars in wrestling from pretty much his debut, which I guess would be '69, '70, uh, through, of course, his his probably best known period would have been early '80s World Wrestling Federation, the cage match with Jimmy Snuka that Mick Foley has made legendary uh, because it was the impetus for a lot of what he did. And uh, Don Morocco wrestled, you know, pretty much all over every major territory, top name throughout the 70s as well. And Don, we want to welcome you to the show. Oh, thanks. I get stuck in a roadblock in my base. I, was, I missed. I was a little late. You know, what, what have you been? What have you been doing as far as uh, um, do you wrestle at all now, or just uh, from time to time? When if somebody calls me up, 
I don't pursue. I haven't pursued any work. But I, every once in a while, Barry Orton gave me a call. He was running a show. Some tired. There's some, you know, if I can get away for a weekend, I, I don't really just to get just to get out of the house for a couple of days. You followed on TV? Uh, a little, yeah. Do you have uh, any 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 kind of thoughts as far as you know the current scene? It's it's so different from during your during your heyday. Um, I, it's I, I, it's pretty good. I, it's enjoyable. I, the, the interview format is a little different, but um, you know, for between Vince's show and and and, and Turner's show, two two completely different uh, two completely different animals. <laughs> <laughs> What are your thoughts? Did you you would have um, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock? You, I would yeah, oh, yeah. you probably bumped into he, him when he was five up. years old in, in, in California, uh, right? Oh yeah, I, I he I grew up. In fact, every time my wife gets around some people, she pulls out uh, pictures of when he used to babysit my daughter and stuff. Oh really? He was, uh, yeah, I knew him. I, you know, I started out with was with Rocky in San Francisco, and then of course I wrestled Peter here in Hawaii. My via the grandfather wrestled Peter here in Hawaii for years off and on. Every time I'd come home, and he 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 you know spent a lot of time with his grandmother and stuff. And and then Rocky in New York, and you know I spent a lot of time with I you know I was married to Rocky off and on throughout my career. So I, I know the kid. I knew the kid real well, and so I'm real happy to see you know what a what a success he's become. Is, is there any other uh, wrestlers from the current, you know, uh, you know, in the current uh, scene who were, where you knew them when they were kids, or just just him? Uh, pretty much him. Hard Bob right. Orton's kid is coming on. Rand, Randy Orton, yeah. 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 Did you know him as a kid? Because I know you were Bob Orton for a long time. Yeah, I knew him. Uh, not as well as I knew Dwayne. I was for some or the, the Rock. For some reason, we always happened to be, uh, you know, in the same area as Rocky. So. Um, I pretty much saw him grow up between the, the you know the mother, Otto the mother and my wife were good friends, and then uh, uh, Leah Maivia, I used to work for her every time I came back to Hawaii, and he he was always over there. He was a spoiled little brat. The grandmother used to spoil him rotten. <laughs> Have you read his book yet? Uh, no, I haven't. No. No. No, I like haven't. Uh, childhood stuff might have compared. I haven't gotten anybody's books yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Foley's book is really good. No, uh, we were we were wondering about his dating stories in high school. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> how much is true and how much is? I don't know. When, you, when you, you when you when you look back on your career in different territories, what are your thoughts on what what would be like a favorite territory you had to work? I mean, I know you you worked a lot of San Francisco. You worked a lot of Florida. I mean, any any you know. I, I, now that I think back on your career, with the exception of the early run in the AWA, you were always kind of. Kind of in warm climate territories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I used to always, uh, I was always looking for surf. I pretty much stayed around that and Australia too. I used to pretty much travel back and forth between uh, between Frisco and Florida, and I spent a couple years in Australia. Then I'd always come back to Hawaii until I got locked into WWF, and they became, you know. Like a mogul overnight. Now, your your early career, you were kind of typecast as a as a babyface. Yet you probably really, I, I don't know. I could be wrong about this. I would think that you had your, you would have your greatest success as a heel. I mean, you were the stronger, I think, as a heel in San Francisco, and certainly WWF. You know, during the period with Jimmy Snuka and Bob Backlund and all that, you were working as a heel. Was that more Was that more comfortable for you? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it was it was really hard going back to being the Rock. And all that people go, wow, you know, I tell you, you're the rock, you're the rock, and then I was, oh god, I hated the rock. I hated it. I had no time for the rock after all those years of being a heel. I just, uh, it was just a, a role I, you know, just was kind of forced into. But yeah, I used to have, I used to have a lot of fun as a heel, controlling the match, leading the match, leading the people. And then I had, had a, I just had a great array of uh, baby faces to work with all you know throughout my career. Any any particular favorite opponent? Jeez, I, I don't know. i would be hard to say. I, was, I had so many great ones. You know, Ivan Koloff when I was when I was a baby face. 
you know, I always, you know, people, I think, have a tendency to forget how, you know, how what, what a performer Ivan was because he's been, you know, in and out for different types of places. But I had a cage match with him in St. Petersburg that people, you know, talk, spoke more of that, highly of that than the one Snooker and I had. You know, then Snooker and Pedro Morales and Steamboat and Bob Back, all the all the guys in WWF, even you know like Hulk and those guys. So, oh, uh, you know, some guys were always money, some guys were hard. <laughs> like even the guys, the guys, the guys were money. <laughs> they were hard. They were easy to take. What uh, um, as far as um, Australia, who were the, who were the guys there when when during the period you went down there? When I went down there, Curtis and Mark Lewin had just about left. I was in New Zealand with Curtis and Mark Lewin, and then when I went to Australia, I went across in Ronnie O'Day, uh, Larry O'Day and Ronnie Miller were running. The Ed Wiskowski, uh, Colonel DeVeers, he was there, Rick Martell, Bugsy McGraw, let me just turn this offhand, uh, Butcher Brannigan, Fuji. He was down in Australia. You were, you were with Fuji uh, in a lot of different areas as far as your career because you, you, team, you teamed with him a lot. He managed you at some points, right? You, yeah. Did you, you, I think you feuded with him at, at when you went babyface turn. Does that sound right? I'm sorry? Um, I think that you may have feuded with him. I know you did the stuff on TNT, Fuji Vice. Oh, yeah, all right. that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cooler classics. <laughs> yeah. Classics for the scrappy. No, I grew. I knew Fuji from uh, Dean's Gym right down here in Waikiki, and uh, he was wrestling, and I was in high school and stuff. And I, I went on the road. He had marital problems. He ended up in Portland, Oregon, where I was pretty much starting out between Vancouver and Portland. So that's uh, I knew Fuji before I even got in the business. And then, um, you know, we're, we're just we're always close friends. Now, what was your start in the business? Were you like, uh, I mean, how did you like make the connections to get in? I just remember you being like a, like a big, like a big, uh, you know, really big guy, early on, not weight wise, but muscularity wise, in, a, in an era where there weren't a lot of that. And then, uh, actually, by by the time you know latter part of your career, you were you were a monster almost. Um, but I mean, as far as uh, how did you? What was your what was your original you know uh, break, breaking in period? Lord Blair's, uh, mm -hmm. Lord Tallyhill Blair's, the Fifty State Wrestling over here. He and Ed Francis ran Fifty State Wrestling in Hawaii, and it was a show that was light years ahead. You could probably compare it to WWF right now, with my, minus the pyrotechnics, you know. Which, you know, you're talking about probably 35, 40 years ago. But, uh, you know, like Johnny Baran, courtesy Alkea, um, Ripper Collins, you know, some, and all the talent. Gene, you're just mentioning Gene Kaninsky. As I came on, he was the world champion, uh, NWA at the time, and he would come through for Vancouver, Jim Haiti. They had guys coming through from Japan and Australia that would stop for vacations and stuff. So they had a tremendous amount of talent coming through Hawaii, and their, their TV show was just just out of sight for its time. It, it didn't compare it to any other wrestling shows. Johnny Bryan was coming out of coffins. Ripper Collins was swishing and, and dressing in drag. All of, you know, it was, it was really. Oh yeah, it was nuts. It was crazy. They were setting fire, and you know, the, the Sheik from Detroit was coming into town. So you know, they're setting stuff on fire. It was, they have old tapes. I guess Ed Francis took a, some tapes back to uh, back to the NWA convention at the time when they had it. You know. The, <laughs> the promoters looked at it and they, they just shook their head and said, hey, "This will never happen. This will never take place." <laughs> and that's uh, that's pretty, it's pretty much the face of wrestling today. But the Lord Blair, he sent me to. Uh, he was the one, me, courtesy Alkea, and uh, Monica Mossman in Japan. We were three, only three proteges. He sent me to Vancouver, and I started with uh, Sander Kovacs and Kaniski, were the promoters then. And uh, was your first big territory as far as like notoriety wise AWA? Yeah, yeah. But I was uh, a match that the Lord book booked me with Fuji, because Fuji was you know we were both green at the time, but hard workers and pretty young. And Vern Gagne, they had Vern Gagne watch the match, 
and uh, Ganya uh, wanted me in Minneapolis. I didn't know that Jim Barnett wanted me in Australia too at the same time, but Blairs didn't want me to go to Australia, so he, he only told me about Vern's offer. <laughs> so I, I ended up in Minneapolis, and that, after that, it was uh, I lasted there a couple of years, and the snow just you, killed me. What was your thoughts of the cold weather? And I, I know you teamed with Jimmy Snuka, although Jimmy Snuka used a different name in those days. Yeah, I hated it there. Really? I, you know, I was I was young and still still did you know was interested in surfing in the beach and everything else and I, I even though I started skiing and doing some other stuff the traveling and the the weather and the and the you know the climate and the seasons and everything just you know they were too much for me so I lasted about a year and a half two two years then ended up in San Francisco for Roy Shires any any specific did you did you know Kim Kim Allen yeah yeah sure yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, I used to live in Santa Cruz, in fact. And I used to commute from Santa Cruz to uh, all the northern California towns. Yeah, because I bumped into him about a year ago, and I mentioned wrestling, and all of a sudden he just goes, you know, like uh, he said he used to train with you. and, and Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah Santa you, Cruz. Yeah, he's from Santa Cruz. I think he's in San Jose now. I think he's a. I think he works for the police or fire department in Santa Cruz. Oh, he's still, still in Santa Cruz. Yeah, I haven't seen him in nine or ten years. Yeah, he promotes bodybuilding shows. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I I bumped into him. God, when, when I bumped into him at the beach, I mean, he's probably, you know, mid forties, and I mean, you know, ripped abs and tremendous condition. Yeah. You know, I say two fifteen, two twenty, maybe two fifteen ish. But I mean, in, in in for for his age, in incredible condition. Yeah, he was always. He was into that bodybuilding. He got, you know, he was. I don't think he ever wrestled. No, no, no. He never did. Yeah. He, just, he, the, the, his closest thing, I guess, was being friends with you. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever consider bodybuilding or powerlifting or anything like that? Um, well, I, I, the, the diet word doesn't isn't in my vocabulary. <laughs> that, that diet is a, is a killer, especially living here in Hawaii. There's so many ethnic foods, so many starches. I, I thought about it a little bit. Right now, I'm recovering. I just had carpal t uh, tunnel. Surgery done on both my hands, so I'm out of work. For... Is that is that related to wrestling, or is that just related? No, to... I was rough from work. Work related. I'm, uh -huh. I work in Longshore now. Uh huh. Stevedore in Hawaii. Hmm. For Matson and the, some of the other shipping companies around here. And we have a ton of emails here for Don Morocco as well as uh, for Bank of Calls. You know, earlier in the show, before you were on, Don, we were talking about WCW Saturday Night, which used to be called Georgia Championship Wrestling and later World Championship Wrestling. Um, it had uh, uh, its final show, actually, uh, in that time slot was this past Saturday, and people were talking about one of their favorite moments. And one moment that people have remembered was uh, when you were there with Roddy Piper, and it was an angle, actually, which turned, you guys were a tag team, and it turned Roddy Piper babyface when you were about to attack Gordon Soley. And do you do you remember what led up to all this as far as um you know uh that angle and and Roddy Piper going baby because Roddy Piper was an awesome heel in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me think. Oh yeah, that was um what really led it was it was, it was turning naturally and you know it was, it was, he was starting to turn baby pace anyway because he'd been there about a year and a half two years. You know, doing the commentary and everything else, but but I think like a week or two weeks previous to that, is um, some guy pulled a knife on him in Raleigh or something. We're one of the one of the Charlotte towns. We were both working Charlotte and Atlanta at the time, and somebody somebody some guy pulled a knife in the thing, and it was around a bunch of around a bunch of kids and stuff, and and uh, somebody somebody cut Piper with the you know and Piper. Kind of went in, you know, and saved the guy, or you know, say, you know, and and got scratched with the knife, and the 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 papers picked it up and carried it. So he was pretty much ready to turn already, and and that that kind of just pushed it over the pushed it over the hill. Uh, this is from someone who is bringing up uh, that you had a real unique way of delivering an Irish whip. You did the one-handed whip, and um, is there did, did you learn that from someone, or did you just pick that up on your own? And also. Uh, you were the, one of the first people to do the tombstone pile driver, also, as I recall. Yeah. Did, I, I don't. Um. I just. I guess the Irish. The, what's the Irish whip? Is the turnbuckle? You know, we just whip the guy with the one arm and the turnbuckle. So I think in those days, everyone used to do it with two arms. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. I guess that was just something that, that came, you know, I just picked up myself. Let's go to Mike in Florida. Mike, you're first up with uh, Don. Hello? Hello? Hi, Dave. Hello there. Hi, yes. Don. Hi. Yeah, I had a question about uh, your matches with Jimmy Snuka. Did any of that heat actually translate to the dressing room? Because you seem to be going hot and heavy. Were you friends? No, no. We, uh, you know, well, this, as far as everybody's smart and stuff now, I right. actually, you know, the, the whole world is <laughs> Dave Meltzer's magazine. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, I think... Uh, the more heated, the more intense the rivalry. Right. The 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 more bitter and the more hateful, um, the more you know death intent it seems. I I think the, uh, the 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 guys are probably better coordinated together. Yeah. So there was never any disagreements or anything. No. Uh huh. And I had a question for Dave about Hogan and Savage. What what's going on with him disparaging against him on the radio? The bubble up sponge. Did you see something bad about Savage? I didn't even. Hogan and Savage. What's going on? The disparaging remarks on Bubba the Love Sponge show. Is that a shoot or an angle or what? What do you think? Problem. What, what Brian is there? Do you know what's going on there? I'm trying to figure what he said. He the disparaging he remarks said. that Hogan and Savage have been exchanging on the radio up in Florida. I haven't oh, heard him. Okay, it's got it got it got to be. I think it's got to be an angle. Although they've had their they've had their problems in the past, but really, you know, I think that they're probably doing something, you know, uh -huh. to build up to build up wherever they're going. Fox right. Network thing, probably. Yeah, are you pretty sure they're still friends? Hogan, I, I don't know if they're friends or not. Hogan okay. Savage, but Thanks. I think that if they're doing something, yep. I mean, Hogan's using that Bubba the Love Sponge thing. Like, I think he's calls him up every day now to kind of uh, get whatever he wants over right. over. You know, right? Since he's since he can't do those interviews on television right. with guys that aren't in the company. Yeah, you know, it seemed like it was pretty serious, but you never know, huh? You, <laughs> you never completely know. Right. With Hulk Hogan, you never know. Thanks, Thanks a lot. <laughs> But it's always it's always a calculated move. Is Dusty got a territory going to Florida? Uh, Dusty's running small indies in uh, Georgia, right, Brian? Dusty? Yeah, he's yeah. got a little group down there. Yeah. Oh, he's still with WCW. He he announces this uh, show that I think they're starting soon uh, on Turner South, which would be like you know old WCW shows. Uh. But uh, he's not. I guess technically he's not with the WCW organization because he's actually still working for ECW. Oh, you know he does. Uh, he was at their TV taping in Chicago uh, Saturday night. Oh, because Johnny Walker told me that he does. He had started his own uh, thing in Florida. Yeah, Turnbuckle Promotions or something. I think uh, it's I called. Don't, I don't know. So you do? You, would you bump into Johnny Walker up there now? I see Johnny Walker. Yeah. Yeah. How's he, he doing? He's doing fine. Doing real well. I mm -hmm. see Curtis Yokea, Lord Blair, Sammy Steamboat once in a while. Don Lewin's around. <laughs> mm hmm. Whatever happened to Mark Lewin? He's in uh, an island off of Washington somewhere, I think. He just kind of uh, he went down to they went to Australia for a couple of weeks to start a promotion down there, but that that that, that went uh, went south. That's about uh, as far south as you can go to. <laughs> This is from Tony Aragona, who wants to know your thoughts of, of various wrestlers that you worked with during your career. He's mentioned, uh, I'll just read down some names and you can respond. Uh, Jack Briscoe. Uh, he was a good amateur wrestler. Uh, had good matches with him. When you first went down to Florida, they kind of positioned you as the new Jack Briscoe. Yeah. You know, when he was already established star and you were coming in as kind of a young guy. Yeah, I think he had the NWA championship at the time. And we worked a few things. I guess uh, we go looked ahead. like. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, what about uh, Curtis Ikea? Well, he's a close friend of mine. He's one of the all-time greatest. You know, his interviews and matches and his, you know stuff he did. I, he never really got exposed in the mainland a lot. You know, on the well, the majority of his work was in Australia and Japan, and some of the stuff and the ideas and. You know, just the things he he was he was one of the forerunners of you know professional wrestling that that is you know come about today. Did you pattern your interviews after Curtis? Oh sure, I'm I'm sure I did. You know, I grew up with him. You know, listening to him on TV, him and Ripper Collins and uh, Johnny Moran. So I'm sure you know subliminally or 
consciously or subconsciously, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of Curtis and a lot, a lot of a lot of different guys in in my interviews. Yeah, uh, Pedro Morales. Pedro Morales. He, I uh, had a lot of good runs with him. A hard worker, you know. He he was uh, he was a real gentleman. Bob Ackland. Oh, a great athlete. Uh, never, never really given much credit for, you know, what he, the way he stayed, you know, the way he was able to maintain his own personality, which was, you know, referred to as, as nothing or none by, you know, most people. But the way, you know, he was just able to keep his own, you know, see, see, take your vitamins, say your prayers, you know, drink your milk. He was, you know, he was like the real guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe maybe Hulk took his stuff off of Backlund because you know Backlund was the guy. Say your prayers, drink, eat your vitamins, go to bed early, train hard. I always, uh, I always get great, great respect just for all the guys you have mentioned so far. How about Pat Patterson? Pat Patterson was a hard worker, hard worker, always, always, always thinking about wrestling. Uh, him and I didn't agree on everything all the time, but uh, uh, he was a hard worker. What did he uh, unfortunately, he came after Ray Stevens, who was you know one of the all-time my at least one of my all-time greats. So he was you know more or less looked at as a, unfortunately. Because he did have a tremendous amount of talent, he's pretty much looked at as a, uh, as, a, as a Ray clone. What do you think yeah, about his current you... role in the WWF? <laughs> oh yeah, you watched Patterson on the WWF TV in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he's in his flaming glory. <laughs> <laughs> he's never. I don't think he's ever been so happy in his life. <laughs> You know, well, you were in San Francisco and wrestled both Patterson and Stevens. Um, I guess probably, and I even remember a tag match you and Fuji against Patterson and Stevens, the cow palace that, that popped into my head. Did um, what, How would you compare the two of them as far as working goes? Because, you know, growing up in San Francisco, it was like Ray Stevens was the god of wrestling and Pat Patterson was the guy who, as you said, I mean, he was like the top guy after Ray Stevens went to the AWA. And, and Pat Patterson, I remember having a lot of great matches with you and with, with everyone in the area. But, yeah. Um, how would you compare the two of them? Because I guess you worked a because you worked a lot with Bachwinkle and Stevens too. Yeah, with Stevens, everything just happened. He never thought of. He never had to think about anything. He never had to prepare. He never had to plan. He was just a natural. He's one of these guys, you know, like Mickey Mantle, go out, get drunk, come into the park and hit three three home runs. And when we're and we're Patterson, on the other hand, worked, worked, worked. You know, let's do this. Put this. Put this in. Put that in. Don't forget this. Remind them. Remember this. Do that. Do this. You know. So they were. They were actually night and day, really. Because Patter uh, Ray would. You know, he'd go out there and just you know, blow the joint apart, and not even you know. Well, I'm sure he was thinking. You know, but it would just. Ray was just a natural. Where Pat. Would you know as good as he was? Pat worked to be that good. Let's go to uh, Dave in Tucson. Dave, you're next up with Don Morocco. Uh, how you doing, Dave? Hey, I'm doing good. Uh, yeah. I, by the way, before I uh, asked Don Morocco, I found I was cleaning out my room today and I found an observer from 1986. This is a collector's item. Listen to this. This is uh, uh just a few notes since I don't pay attention to this area in the WF. This Ted RCD. The power lifter with the 700-pound bench press uh, made his pro debut at a recent taping. Obviously, we won't know for a long time while whether uh, he'll amount to anything because pro wrestling is a craft that, except in rare cases, takes years to learn. Would you say uh, Ted RCD learned that craft? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, were you around with Ted RCD? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, in fact, he went to Australia. <laughs> When he went on an Australian tour when he was still wrestling, <laughs> when Andre was still alive. Yeah. For some reason, Andre couldn't stand the guy. Right. I don't know if it was because he was the world's strongest man or something, I don't know. But uh, Andre, just, Andre just didn't like him. 
And then when you get a giant not like him, like life can be hard. <laughs> you just don't want to be in the same a zip code. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and one of those uh, observers I found, you wrote about the Morocco steamboat feud going too long. You wrote that it was a nine-month feud with no ending. Yeah. Do you remember, uh, <laughs> it, was a long, it was a long feud, and then it went to uh, it was a steamboat, steamboat feud with Morocco and Fuji, and Mr. Fuji, too. Yeah, I remember I, I, that. Yeah, I remember that, uh, how they started it. Wasn't it like a steamboat Fuji match, and then like Morocco came out, and you, you hit him with a, or with a chair? It was like the most gimmick chair I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> okay. I, I, um. Yeah. What was, also, what was it like working with the uh, Grand Wizard? What was the Grand Wizard like, Don? A uh, very selfless man. He'd do anything. He'd do everything to get uh, his guy over. Didn't worry about you know. Didn't worry about himself. Wasn't uh, you know? He wasn't. Um, you know, he wasn't so. He just he, his his his. Job was as a manager was to get you over or wherever his his uh, his guy was, and that's all. He didn't try to get himself over. He was trying to get you know, he was just trying to get you in the match over. Yeah, I was very very young uh, as he died, so I really haven't like seen much stuff with him. What, what was your opinion of the Grand Wizard, Dave? I mean, I just remember him being a very good interview. Um, you know, in those days, in the in, in the WWF days, the managers. At that point, didn't do a lot of the physical stuff around the ring, and, and the wizard, you know, compared to like the managers of later years and in other territories, he was more of a guy who dressed up in a very, uh, you know, very funny ring attire and did some really good promos to get, you know, the heels over against uh, whoever the the champion and the top baby faces were in those days. Yeah, like, didn't he? Uh, he managed like Luke Graham, I think. I'm trying to remember. He, he managed a million people. I mean, the wizard, you know, Billy Graham. Um, how, you know, how old? Do you know how old he would be if he were still alive? The wizard? I don't know. Don, do you have any idea how old the wizard would be if he was still alive? Oh, God, in his early 80s, maybe? I, mean, I would... See, if he was in his... Let's say he was in his mid-50s when he died, and that could be wrong. I could be wrong about that. And I would say he probably died around 82, 83... So maybe maybe early seven maybe early mid seventies. Someone someone will actually email us with the correct answer to that one before the end of the show. I'm sure. Yeah, like in those old observers, uh, you were like you were extremely critical of the WWF. Oh yeah 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 yeah, because it changed uh, it changed wrestling and it uh, it destroyed the territories. <laughs> you know, Don, I, I, was, I was actually going to be my next question for you is that um, what was it like? Um, as as you know, you were there really on the ground floor when this thing went uh, from you know being a regional company to the big national company, and and everything everything changed. And uh, you were with Piper and Bob Orton. Uh, did your life change, or was it just, you, or were just kind of sitting there watching with amazement or or or, or disbelief or or, belief, or total belief in, in what was going on and how wrestling was changing in those days? Uh, a lot of both. You know, my life changed a lot. You know, you get, uh, I wasn't able to get back to Hawaii anymore to get, you know, kind of get grounded and, and get focused and stuff. So I, and so I was pretty much locked into, um, locked into the business as it went and as it was growing and into the pay per view and into the, you know, into the cable times and into the cable syndication, you know, this cable syndications away from, uh, from territorial, from different, from the different territories. Uh, hey, Don, I was wondering, uh, when you did the Saturday Night Main Event shows, when you were performing on NBC, was there, like, an extreme amount of pressure for you to, like, perform to another level? Because whatever I, like, watch, even though, like, the Observer that I found, Dave, you gave, like, a horrible review of the Saturday Night Main Event. It seemed like they upped the pace and put on, like, a lot of good matches. Like, I remember the Rockers and the Brain Busters wrestled a lot of times on the Saturday Night Main Event. Do you remember, uh, Dave? Do you remember like a blue blazer Owen, or a blue blazer Ted DiBiase match? Vaguely. Yeah, Actually, I mean, I vaguely remember. I mean, I, I remember the Saturday Night's Main event. They used to always have. Um, they would usually start out with a Hogan match, you know, to further the program, and then they would usually fill it out with like the real good workers, and they would go up and down, and um, you know, and then sometimes they they weren't as good. I don't know. They did. They did. Well, a lot I do of remember a really lame like judo jacket match they had with Morocco and Steamboat. On one side wasn't good? I don't, re I don't remember that one. Um, I, I remember the feud. I remember, you know, I remember a lot of good matches, though, in that era, you know, with Terry Funk and JYD, believe it or not. 
um, Morocco and Steamboat. Those were like the two big marriages I remember on the road that were always usually really good. Terry Funk seemed like the only guy who could get a good match out of the junkyard dog. Like Ric Flair couldn't really do it. Yeah, that that well, I remember we we're talking about that stuff. Um, God, Terry Funk. I I used to think he was killing himself to get good matches out of the junkyard dog. I mean, it was like he may have been. That's the whole family. Yeah, the whole family. I, the old man was like that. The old man Terry Terry. Terry was a lot like the Junior was a consummate pro, Junior was a consummate professional. Junior was you know he, maybe as exciting as watching paint dry, but when you, by the time you watched his hour go through, you'd really seen a match. Whereas Terry was like the old man, of a, you know that fight out into the parking lot, you know into somebody's car, into you know into a pickup truck. But the old man used to do that. Terry does the old. Terry's still doing all the old man stuff. Uh, <laughs> hey Don, do you look at uh, that uh, WrestleMania three? You wrestled the first match uh, with Bob Orton. Do you consider that one as a highlight to your career? And where, where is that? Uh, WrestleMania. The WrestleMania, the, the big WrestleMania in Pontiac Silverdome. Oh, with uh, Martel and uh, Zink. I don't know if yeah. it's a highlight. It was, a, it was certainly, you know, it was a quite a ninety-something thousand people. It was a pretty, you know, it was a hell of an experience. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to ask you, and uh, if you don't feel comfortable answering this question, that's fine. Um, when you were playing The Rock, did you did you use any steroids? Yeah, I went through the juice uh, period. Like, was there any pressure for you to uh, for WWF performers to at the time to do that? I think it was internal pressure. The the office never put pressure on you, but you know, you, you saw Hulk and you saw all these guys that were you know, it, it was no longer. It was no longer a case of getting down and grinding the match out for 25, 30 minutes, you know, and getting something. Oh, you know, I thought Dory Funk's uh, senior style, that old, you know, that old wrestling style and the, the selling and the working, and it, 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 it transpired past that. So I, I don't think there was no external pressure, but I think, you know, to keep up with the, um, you know, to keep up with the Joneses, yeah. There's a lot of, you know, just, you know, I wanted to get better. Wanted to, you know, to wanted to look competitive. Since that was the whole, the, the arena was, you reached that type of competitiveness, you know, and it, that that look had taken place, you know. In, in that in, in that era, in that era, your your physique and how you looked was probably far more important than even in the 70s. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. In the 70s, you were kind of judged... Would you say you were judged more on on kind of your athletics and in the and in the eighties more on your look? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was a different working technique in the, from the seventies to the uh, you know then eighty three, eighty four. It just kind of changed, you know. And uh, it, you know, it started maybe a little bit before that, but uh, in the seventies. There was, you know, the working technique was different. The, the working, you know, the selling and the working and everything else was, was different. And then when you became a uh, slave to the cable and the instant replay and everything else, the timing changed. I think part that's of it may have varied on who you worked for, too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's true, too. Roy Shires is a slave driver. <laughs> Here's today's question. Don Morocco once wrestled a 60-minute match in Madison Square Garden. Who was his opponent in that match? So, Don, you better not tell anyone. <laughs> um, we've also got a couple of big... Do we have a winner major... yesterday? Uh, yeah, we had two winners yesterday. Um, I don't know. I don't know their. I don't remember their names though. But we did have two winners. Um, the answer was Harley Race for the King of the Ring, who actually went on the road and defended the King of the Ring title. In fact, Don Morocco was the first King of the Ring in, in uh, Foxborough Stadium in. 85-86, when they actually did the first tournament. Um, this, okay, let me just get through this real quick. Um, the USA Network lost the case. The judge just ruled against them, I guess, probably within the last hour. Uh, let me read this. It says, uh, USA Networks Incorporated lost its court battle against World Wrestling Federation, Entertainment Inc., and Viacom Inc. Tuesday. The decision means the four WF series that are currently carried on the USA Network will move to the National Network and MTV, which are both owned by Viacom in September. So that's 
Uh, Sunday Night Heat's going to be on, on uh, MTV. And uh, Livewire, Superstars, and Raw will move to the Nashville Network. I don't know what that means. I guess we'll have to find out what that means for ECW. Um, there's not really much else to that other than there's a quote here I wanted to give you. Brian, I thought you'd get a kick out of this. from Stephen Chow. He's the president of the USA Cable. who says, quote, listen to this quote. Quote, we, 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 we would have preferred a different decision, but as we have said, the loss of the WWF will have a negligible effect on our ratings and a positive effect on our cash flow. <laughs> That's why they sued. We would have preferred. Oh, they would have preferred. They would have preferred to win, yeah. And also, the uh, New Jersey State Senate yesterday voted 36 to 1 to approve the measure to regulate extreme wrestling. It's the bill that we've talked about a million times on this show. The bill goes to New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman for her signature, and she will sign it, being that she was one of the original sponsors of the bill. So that bill is going to be law uh, very shortly. Okay. Uh, let's... Oh, we're, oh, we're, um, before we get to the, get back to the calls, um, Don, you know, I want you brought up something that's kind of interesting as far and so did Brian as far as the um, what did you, as far as in different parts of the country working for Eddie Graham, working for Roy Shires, working for Vern Gagne, uh, Vince McMahon Sr. As far as in the ring and outside of the ring, you know, what were the differences? What do you remember the most about him? Who was the hardest to deal with? Who was the easiest? Who wanted the most? Things like that. Uh, Roy Shires, that, that was a, a high spot territory. He wanted high spots. You know, he wanted to get together, get four or five high spots every match. All you know, and the uh, you know, ready, all set to go for the match. The um, with Eddie Graham, that was a wrestling territory. They wanted more wrestling, and, and you know, and then of course they kill the first four or five matches up, and they'd come a Dusty or Mephisto or somebody like that. So, you know, it was a, but Eddie Graham was more of a wrestling. Or grind it out uh, type area. Fern Gagne was uh, was early marketable type place where they had different markets, kind of like the, the the late WWF or the early WWF with Vince Senior, where you had your your market set up, and he had like Milwaukee and Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul, and those types. So it, it was. Uh, you kind of it was all, kind of an already big star situation where they'd feed you the squash matches and, and just send out the stars. Or the other, other the, the first two territories, San Francisco and Florida, you pretty much worked them in the town from first match to last. And then, and then the early WWF with Vince Senior it was pretty much the same. You were made a star on TV. They fed you down the throat for six, seven, eight weeks, and then you went out into the, uh, you went out and you hit all the the major arenas, and the smaller arenas. Was there any kind of a big buzz for you when you first worked Madison Square Garden, or was it sure. nothing? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think everybody does. You know, in the Garden, New York, New York. You know, the city's so big they had to name it twice. Yeah. But uh, you know, I sold out Call Palace. And, had uh, big big houses in Tampa, St. Pete, Atlanta, Omni, and stuff like that. And even working around there before I got actually to the Garden. In fact, my my first match in the Garden was uh, with Rick Martel. It wasn't uh, an A title match. It was you know, where I came around kind of kind of different. With me, usually used to put the guy the heat the top heel on TV six six to nine weeks, and you come right in with the champion. Where I came in and just kind of worked my way up from there. A little different. Every the, the pattern was still pretty much the same. I was just individually a little bit different the way I went around about it at that time. Um, let's see. Let's go. Let's go to Adam in Brooklyn. Adam, what's going on? Oh hey. Hey Dave, uh, hey Don, I'm a big fan of both you guys. Um, I'd like to say that uh, one of my favorite Don Morocco uh, moments was on a Coliseum Home video when him and uh, Mr. Fuji went to Hollywood to audition for different uh, television shows. I was wondering if you guys remember that. And, oh, yeah. And, like, you know, they did a Miami Vice parody. Fuji, Fuji, Fuji Vice. Vice. Fuji yeah. Vice. Yeah, on, on TNT. Yeah. I thought those, that stuff was hilarious. And also, that was one of the follow-ups later. We're, we're, they were kicking us out of all the studios and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we walked up to the gate. We were walking over. It all says in limos and Fuji. We're on foot walking in the gate. And they put a guy in the guy. Get the hell out of here. But yeah, we did some, we had some fun stuff. 
And also, I was watching um, some tapes I got of uh, Stampede Wrestling, and I was wondering what your thoughts of uh, wrestling there, Don, were, because I know you were the champion when you beat uh, Mike Shaw. Where was this, now? Um, Stampede Stamp- Wrestling. Stampede in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Stampede, yeah. Uh, it was just a, you know, it was just a trip, a pleasure to go there and, and be involved with Stu and work, you know, what was, what was going on at the time with those guys. It was, it had pretty much, it had reached its peak, you know, it had gone down. WWF was already established there. And there were, um, Baby Boy was home. So they just, I was kind of, it's my eight or ten months in the independent circuit. And, uh, yeah, it's it's fun to go and just meet, you know, get get to know Stu and go up to the house for the Sunday dinner and then stuff like that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I always like that kind of uh, stampede style of wrestling where they concentrate more, you know, on good old wrestling matches. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's like amazing watching it because I was like watching uh my the tape I got and it had so many like stars of today, like back then. I mean, like guys like Steve Blackman were wrestling, you know, in Stampede, and yeah. you know. It's amazing, Jason like, Liger. he had long hair back there, too. Yeah, Jushin Liger and all those guys. Liger and yeah. Hase, I think. Hase. Yeah. yeah. Ha- ha- Hase just got elected uh, to the House of Representatives uh, Sunday. Yeah, I, I heard. Um, yeah. I also like to comment on uh, WCW about Terry Taylor. Uh huh. I think he's doing a really good job and doing something Russo couldn't, and that's getting over the mid-card talent. Because um, Russo, he always claimed that he thinks everybody should seem important and have a gimmick and everything. When he's there, he like you know gives them so little time individually that they, people really don't have time to you know start caring about them. And what Terry Taylor has been able to do since he came in is give guys like three count and like you know even like guys like Mark Jindrak and uh, showing out showing out here time to like shine and you know get pops from the crowd and get people interested. And uh, yeah, they don't they're, they're not you know with, with with Russo I always sense they were rushing from thing to thing, and with Taylor at least they they, they give every like segment. I guess adequate time to make it. Yeah, and, and things seem to like make sense. I mean, sometimes my people uh, like might be obvious, you know, what they're doing, but at least it serves a purpose. Like with Duggan and Goldberg, I thought that was like really well done, even though it wasn't the greatest match. Like you know how they built up Duggan had cancer for you know, even though he wrestled many times after that. But you know, and Duggan actually you know got Goldberg a lot of heat, and he was played the face in that match, and they got their job done getting Goldberg over for at least for one night. I thought. At least for one night, they did a tremendous... Yeah, as far as, like, getting people to boo Goldberg, they did a tremendous job. Yeah. yeah. And, um... Uh, one more thing. Do you think, um... Uh, that the Cruiserweight title will be put into effect any more, uh... You know, strongly now that Terry Taylor is Booker? Because I know he wanted to have, bring in the... You know, make the WF Light Heavyweight title stronger when he was there, but that kind of got kiboshed by uh, Russo. Well, I think it'll be more than... Than with Ru- Russo, there was no hope, realistically. With Taylor, you know, Terry Taylor used to uh, be like a junior heavyweight champion, like very, very early in his career. I think, I think that it'll have a, more of a fair shake than it has had in the last uh, whatever it's been eight months. Um, as far as how prominent uh, it'll be, you know, the problem with with that division as compared to when it, the glory days of that division is, is that the talent level isn't there that it, that was there, you know, before. I mean, if you look at all the guys they had, they're either in WWF. Or they're injured and retired, or they've been fired. So it's it's really, you know, there's really not a lot of guys there now for for that junior heavyweight you know, cruiserweight division. As you know, you know, I mean, you can, you know, there's the, and then there's a problem of do you want to put Billy Kidman in there? You know, which is probably his most effective in ring matches would be in there. But then it's sort of like people would go, oh, you know, he just feuded with Hulk Hogan. Now you're going to make him a cruiserweight. You know what I mean? So it's. I I don't know what he's going to do with it, but you know, I don't think he's going to put it on. At least they won't put it on a woman. They won't put it on a woman or and they won't put it on, on Ed Ferrara, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think even though they might not have the caliber worker, you know, like a uh, Malenko or Guerrero, if they give, you know, even the power plant guys, like Elix Skipper, you know, good time to put on a, you know, a decent match, the belt can get over again. It's just a matter of, like, how they play and not like you know, you're, you're, you're right. You know, and they, and they do have they do have you know they have Ray, they have Hooven to Guerrero, they have Christopher Daniels, you know, and there's there's and there's guys out there that they could bring in as well. Um, so yeah, they could they could have a decent they could have a good division if they treated it like they were serious about it. If you treat anything like you know you care about it, it can it can get over even if you don't have like the best talent. Like Duggan, you know, Duggan's not that great, but people love him and you know they pushed it hard. And I thought you know they did a very good job. They did they did the best job they could have done with with that with that situation. I don't know something with the 
the cancer. I don't know. It was like kind of, kind of. I was like going back and forth on that one last night. You know, she's like, God, you know, he really had cancer, and they were like really trying to like make us believe he was gonna, you know, he was gonna die. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, <laughs> but I really I, I don't know. His, I really love his promo last night, Duggan. It's like, you know, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. I, I think know, that same you know, promo he's been doing for 18 years. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> well, I mean, he's doing do... some, you know, crazy problems in WCW, like when he called uh, Hogan a great technical wrestler. Well, not always, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that was one of the classic lines of all time. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, yeah, I could beat you in a fight, but you're, you, Cherry, you may be a great technical wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely the first time Hogan's been called that. <laughs> all right, Dave. Thanks <laughs> for the time. time, too. <laughs> the only time, yeah. Okay. I gotta say, the best thing Terry Taylor's done is have Tank Abbott knock out both of Chronic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, that was awesome. Tank Abbott dancing is so... It's like one of those things that's so bad it's good. <laughs> yep. I, um, I don't know. The the the, uh, the three count thing, I mean, it's like... That is the worst song I've ever heard of wrestling. <laughs> that thing that three counts dancing to now. Oh, let's go to Chad in North Carolina. Chad, you're next up. Hey, guys, how's it going? It's going good. Um, I heard a few weeks ago you were talking about the Hogan A&E biography and... Some of the ridiculous quotes he said. Yes. He forgot one. Uh oh. He said that um, Andre the Giant died right after WrestleMania three. Yeah, that, that one's that's short, that short time after. Yes, yeah. six years. Yeah, I know. I know that one's been going around for a while. Yeah. I think I think that one was created by Vince in yeah. the. Uh, where did where did he create that one first? Brian, would you remember where that when that was first said? Yeah, that it might was have been the, that secret. Uh, what was it called? No, 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 no. It might have been the um. Well, was there an Unreal MS History? No, 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 no. It might have been Unreal History. It might have been M the MSNBC. Didn't they do a thing on? Um... No, 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 no. You know what that was? It was it was WrestleMania. The WrestleMania. Remember? It was. I think it the was Unreal the... History was even before that, and I think he said it there. Well, that Andre died. I remember on the on the WrestleMania thing, they tried to like act like you know Andre was going to die, and Vince gave him like an extra year of life by giving him the heel turn in the Hogan match, like he had something to live for. Mm. When in fact, you know, the guy like you know, and then like after he did the program, he died, and it was like, wait, he died like six years later. I'm pretty and, sure uh, that Psychosis going to ECW. Who? Psychosis. I don't know where that stands. I know they were um, there was a lot of phone calls going back and forth, and I kind of expect it to happen. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that it's a final deal yet, though. And the last thing, um, do you know if and when Super Crazy will be back in the U.S.? Uh, whenever the paperwork's done and the immigration department lets him back in, <laughs> I mean, they're wor they're working on it, and it, it he he it's not hasn't happened yet. Mm. All right, so. guys, thanks. All right, you're very welcome. Let's go to Matt in Vancouver. Matt, what's going on? Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Very good. Well, that's good. Uh, Rock. Right. Hi, how are you doing? All right. Well, that's good. Um, I'd like to know what you think of Mr. Fuji and Lou Albano and their professional career and their personal lives, and are you still friends with them? Uh, yeah, I'm still friends with them. Uh, boy, both their careers, I, th I thought, were uh, ran a, you know, quite a distance and were extremely successful. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, as for their personal life, I don't think I have any business commenting on it. <laughs> Knowing them both so well, might be you know, for some lawsuits, even though I or lose a couple of friends. <laughs> um, I would also like to know what what was this thing with Sugar Ray Robinson that you went with? Uh, what what sort of angle did you do with them, or was it an angle? Sugar Ray Robinson. Well, uh, Sugar Ray Roberts, right? Sugar, Is that his name? Sure. Do you do Sugar Ray? No. Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson was like a boxer, like probably like in the fifties, right? Yeah. Wasn't there some something between uh, Don the Ro Don Morocco and him? No. I don't remember anything. Not that like I can that. remember. Well, they said that in Raw magazine. I was just <laughs> confirming if it was true or not. We don't even know what it is to confirm. <laughs> okay, and why wasn't the Great Mood on Nitro? Do you know? I have no idea. I, what the what? The great mood on Nitro. I was wondering that. I was wondering that myself, since uh, he's in the country. Well, they were um, promoting it on their website. I, you know, I just thought you guys would know. Um, I, 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 I believe it or not, I have not talked to anyone that was there last night, other than, I mean, other than to find out he wasn't there. I mean, no one in power to give me like a reason as, as far as like why he wasn't there or used. I mean, New Japan sent him. 
He might be on Thunder tonight, um, but I'm not even sure of that. Do you well, think, they were going to do the deal where he put that mask on Vampiro, and they wanted to tease it being thing. Obviously, he couldn't be there. Oh, do, th do they think that, uh, does New Japan Bro Wrestling think that they're going to do it like they do with Jushin Thunder Liger and the bottle finish with the Hoovy? I don't think that they really care. I think just the idea is, is that they want him on television in the United States so they can tell their people, because they're running an angle in New Japan that, that WCW stole Keiji Muto from them. And actually, it's a way to keep him away because he's he's got bad knees, and he's just trying to rest his knees and everything like that. But they need to get him on at least a, a few television shows, to, or else that angle is, like, really stupid. It'd be like, you know, when Rob Van Dam was Mr. Monday Night for six months before he became Mr. PPV, but he never wrestled on Monday Night. So they're just trying to give, like, a sense of reality to their angle that, you know, this company has, you know, this this evil American company has stolen their, their one of their top stars. So... He just needs to make, you know, I, 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 it's, it really doesn't matter what he does. He just has to be on the TV. That's the key. Do you think he'll get a title shot or a world title shot or something like that? I, I, that's up to the bookers. I don't think that they, I don't think that they're anyone serious about programming him or and doing anything with him. I think it's just making appearances on TV and just showing his face. I don't um, think that, as far as like you know, pushing him to the top. I don't think, I don't think he's going to be around a lot. I mean, there's so much politics going. That the guys who are full time can't get those positions, so they're not going to bring a guy in from Japan, you know, and give him that position, no matter how talented he's, you know, and, and good his rep is. Um, also, is it true that XPW will invade ECW at Heat Wave because they said something big will happen on July 16th, and then that's that's when the pay per view is. XPW like going there and like, oh god, I mean, there's not they got lawsuits against each other, so I don't think they're going to do any interpromotional angle. I can't. How they invade? I can't, Hit the ring. Uh, they won't hit the ring because it's, but you know, they might. I don't know. Maybe they'll like cat call from the stands. Yeah, that'll just like ruin the pay per view. Have a big sign. Yeah, they they could do that, but then they just take down the sign. I don't know. I, yeah, but if, you know if, what if, though? That looks so ghetto for one group to be in the crowd holding up a sign for another group. Yeah, that's all that they'll do. Well, if Paul Heyman, think about this. If Paul Heyman will not do business with WCW. Or with WWF, as far as you know, doing a promotion versus promotion feud, why would he do anything with XPW? No, couldn't it be a shoot? Would they be allowed in? <laughs> not, on, not on television. I mean, I'm sure there's they're suing. I mean, they're suing each other. That's a shoot. Yeah. I mean, as far as like, well, what are they? You know, as far as like on the pay per view, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to get arrested for trespassing or something, or you know, interfering with the live show. No one's going to do that. You know, I mean, if there's a, you know, those kind of run-ins don't exist in the real world. Like uh, Vince McMahon, he said in he said in a magazine that when ECW invaded Raw, that they were gonna his lawyers were gonna talk to them or something like that. That was, that was the all, Philadelphia that, pay-per-view. That was all an angle. That was a hundred percent angle. hundred percent, start to finish. I mean, I know a lot of people didn't know that at the time, but I mean, it was it was a hundred percent angle. When Sandman spit Savio Vega's face or whatever, it was it was all work. hundred percent, start to finish. Okay, and uh, do you do you guys know if the McMahon will wrestle again? Because I don't think they should. Like, oh, I would say for sure. I would say for sure. For sure, they will. Well, they don't need to be main event. They could be like mid card or something like that. Will Shane go back to mid card? <laughs> <laughs> when you own the company, you don't. You're not a mid carder. <laughs> this well, look at it this way: they got away with a they got they got away with a pay per view with a six man tag on top. Yeah, I just I was thinking about that the other day, the King of the Ring, and I think that was one of his less spectacular pay-per-views of all time. But you know, usually blow everything off with the six man, and he was able to blow it off with the six man. But uh, it, it's just like they're pushing David Flair or something like that. You know, it's just like they shouldn't push the product on you if you don't want it that much. Like I know I know what you're saying with with, with David and uh, you know. I mean, I, 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 I wish they had done it differently with David and like trained him to be, you know, trained him to be a good wrestler when he was ready to debut him rather than send him out there. How many gyms does his, how many gyms does his dad own and he hasn't gone to one of them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know he was he was thrown in he was thrown in there with a minimum. I mean, when he first started, I mean, when you talk about a minimum of training, I think he had like, you know, like one or two, you know, like yeah, like virtually nothing. They they put him out there. You know, way too quick. Which, unfortunately, I mean, that's the story of WCW, WWF. When they have someone under contract, generally speaking, and of course, Vince, and Vince, Vince McMahon, of course, is the is the 
is, is the example that that proves that this isn't always right. But usually, you know, I mean, they they don't bring guys in too quick. I mean, look at Angle. I mean, we, for 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 months and months and months. When's Kurt Angle coming? But when he came, he came exactly when he was ready. If he'd come too soon, he probably would have never made it as big as he did. Whereas WCW with those guys, you know, Sean O'Hare last night, it was probably you know six months to a year too soon. You know, but you know. Had, what you say about that? That's exactly because you look at Angle, then you, you take before him Ken Shamrock, and those guys turn into pretty decent workers. Whereas yeah. in the past, you know, as a rule, you know, uh, an old shooter or amateur wrestler would never would never uh, turn into a decent professional wrestler. Do you think that NCAA star that they signed? Do you think he'll become a big professional wrestler? Will they do the same thing with him like they did with Shamrock and Angle? Brock Lesnar? Yeah. They'll give him a, they'll give him a chance. I mean, you 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 never know. Like uh sight unseen, I mean, he's got a great look. You know, the fact that he's a great amateur, that's both a plus and and it can be a minus depending on on the mindset, you know. Depending on his mindset. I mean, if he goes in there with this mindset that in real life I'm I'm, you know, uh, an unbeatable amateur wrestler, what am I doing losing? If he starts thinking like that, he's already in trouble. Um if he starts thinking of it as sport and not entertainment, he's got to, you know, you got I mean, Angle really has a hell of an attitude. I mean, if you really look at it, you know, he doesn't mind losing, and um, you know, he he embraces the theatrical, you know, like a student of the game. You know, he doesn't. You gotta have there. it. You gotta have it. So yeah. you, know, you either got it or you don't. You ain't got it. Are they signing his, uh, his brother to the WWF? No, They're no, not? not yet. No, it's not his brother anyway. It's his um, nephew, Mark. In, well, there, there's been saying that it was his brother, Apple. Yeah, yeah, he's got a he's got a nephew um, who just yeah I know I'd heard it was his brother too, but he was on the show and he said it was his nephew that uh, I think, I think Ross he, even said that. Yeah, it's it's his, it's his nephew, not his brother. Mark. And uh, will the Rock lose the title next month quickly? Or I don't even know what the card. I don't even know what the card is next month. <laughs> Brian, do you even know what the card is? I have no idea. Yeah. He, he don't, well, I, don't get me wrong. He's a he's a good on he's good on the microphone and he's a good champion. I just don't think they should give him the title this time. Maybe at SummerSlam or something. I, I, I thought it was, you know, I, I don't know. They, they changed it too much for my taste anyway because, you, you know, I mean, Hel I thought Helmsley was a great champion. I really did because he, he held it for a while and he got some big wins. And, you know, when he lost he, it, it he was... He was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Talk about a guy uh, that works hard. And he does work hard, but I don't see him with all that much charisma and stuff. I, I just, with Stone Cold going and The Rock coming and this, and he held down that job spectacularly. Well, will Austin come back soon? Because they've been saying mm -hmm. SummerSlam, and, or even longer than that. He's got a, an appointment in August. I mean, seriously, through the be, 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 until the middle of August, nobody really knows the answer. You know, he's got... He's going to be examined in the middle of August, and then the doctor will say how well he healed, and based on how well he heals, he'll either come back for limited duty or he won't come back at all. Or maybe he'll be able to come back full-time, although that's a long ways off. So until then, we're going to have Shane McMahon main event? Not necessarily. Let's I hope go. not. Look, it looks like, it looks like they, they did something to keep him off for a little while. Okay. Well, thanks for the time, and Rock, I, thanks for talking to me. Bye -bye. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay, let's go to Masad in Pennsylvania. Masad, what's up? Hello, how are you guys? Very good. Um, I, w I had a question about the King of the Ring paper. I kicked out of the pedigree. What was the deal with that? Uh, they, they do that on the main, in main events a lot these days. It's no, kind of like... It was too anticlimactic. I mean, it, it wasn't in the middle of the ring. It looked like The Undertaker was supposed to come in there and break it up. Oh, I think it was like supposed to that, Where he didn't think the say was going to be, you know, in time, so he kicked out. Yeah, I mean, looking at the positioning, I thought Undertaker was supposed to pull him off, and I don't know if he did kick out and Undertaker did pull him off, and it kind of happened at the same moment. Yeah, and um, my next question was, uh, what's the deal with WCW doing, uh, say, Great American Bash and uh, Super Brawl and all those buildings, all those uh, pay-per-views in the same building every year? What do you mean? Oh, you mean just like, like the like tradition the, of the always going to Baltimore? Baltimore uh, Daytona? Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, see, Super Bowl is always Bay Area. Just a traditional thing that they're trying to build in, in different markets. I don't know if it'll work or not. Uh, it didn't work this year. <laughs> but, but that didn't matter which buildings they were in. It wasn't going to anyway. And uh, my third question was, how's the combined pay-per-view from Mexico? Um, which, is that worth taking a look at? The, it wasn't a pay-per-view. It was just a regular show. It's not it was just a, a combined I, show? Yeah, I had heard from a wrestling standpoint it wasn't that good. Um, I, you know, that's that was the report I got. I haven't seen it yet. 
um, my last comment was, uh, how funny was Kurt Angle when he said, uh, I won three times last night, this guy lost. <laughs> oh, yeah, with, with Hosley? Yeah. That was, that, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. I'll go now. Okay. A lot. Okay, you're welcome. What do you think of Kurt Angle, Don? What was that? Excuse me? What do you think of Kurt Angle? Uh, I think he's he, I think he's pretty good. I I, I like him. I think he's uh, got a good handle on the mic, and he's turned into a good professional wrestler. As I said earlier, you, uh, you know, as a rule in the in the past, those kind of guys would never you know develop into pro in professional wrestling because of, of, of attitude and stuff. But this guy, he looks, uh, you know, he's right he's right with it, and it, he moves well. He moves. I mean, you know, he's, he was an athlete, of course, but he moves exceptionally well. Uh, like I said earlier, that with Shamrock, you know, there is another guy you wouldn't expect, you know, to develop into much and, and watch it. And you know, I, I guess you could knock him too, but just to, to, to what the way he came around was able to do business. I, I see uh, Kurt Angle pretty much in the same mold, coming across real good. I, I like him. Who, are, who are, as far as the guys in the today scene, who who do you like to watch the most? Uh, you? I like the Rock. I like well, I like I like McMahon's guys. You know the the, the way they they have it. Um, I like the uh, the Dudley boys. The the white guy, the big white guy. I think he he's probably got he's got a lot of potential. Um, I like McMahon's program. The way you know, you figure with the, if the Rock can only win one match out of one week out of five, you know, and everybody's every, he's got everybody doing jobs there, and, and everybody you know, everybody losing every week, and the way he keeps everybody out, everybody over. Uh, I was in Japan with Jericho the last time I was there, and I was uh, you know pretty impressed the way he's he's come up and then way he's you know. He's handled the, uh, you know, the mic and the, the the crowd and everything else. There's a lot of good talent there. Um, Anyone on the other side? Uh, I don't watch um, the other side too much. I've seen, uh, I'm sure there's guys, you know, like the Steiner. I like uh, Papa Pop just because he's ripped to the max, you know. Does he remind you of Billy Graham at all? Uh, not really. Really? <laughs> no, he, he's more. Uh, Billy was Billy was as soft as a feather. Mm -hmm. You never even knew Billy was in the ring. You know, we're we're, we're um, Steiner, the Papa Pump. He gives me the impression that you know he can rock your world. Uh, <laughs> it comes through the television set, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but Billy Graham, well, he was uh, he was like a baby, you know. He was he was like a, he was soft as a feather. Were you were you and him friends? Yeah, he was my. He, in fact, he was my last uh, manager. Right. Yeah, in the WWF run. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when I was a Rock. He yeah, was. You probably, uh, did you probably work with him like different territories running around too? I worked right? with him in L.A. Wayne Cole when he when he first uh, when Dr. Jerry Graham was in the territory. This would have to be, God, 1970, 77, just before I went to uh, Minneapolis. So I worked with him in L.A., then he came to Minneapolis, then he was he was in Florida for a while. He'd come down to Florida when he was uh, working for Vince already. So I knew Billy for a long time, from when I first got in the business. Wayne no. Coleman. Now, uh, let's, let's not, should we have time to go for one more call, or should we just wrap it up? Okay, let's go to Jerry in Indiana. Jerry, you're going to be our last caller. Yeah, hey, Dave. Thanks for uh, getting me in. Okay. Um, re three, three real quick questions here. Uh, first, uh, do you think Kurt Angle will be able to turn um, more as a Triple H type appeal, more of a sadistic type of uh, you know nature? Um, in him, because I think that's that's the thing that that people uh, people I've talked to are, are saying that they, you know when they saw him come out last night as imperial imperial margin boy, you know margarine boy that that wasn't that wasn't what they were expecting as the guy who's your number two heel now, you know who's who looks like uh, supposedly is going to be starting up a program with the Rock. 
Yeah, he has to do something real nasty, doesn't he? Right. What? Everyone's aware of that, though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was I was thinking that he was going to strike uh, Triple H or The Rock with the scepter, you know, last night, but I don't know. Um, second question. Um, about Sunday Night Heat, um, when they move over, I'm assuming they're, they're going to move that program to MTV once this... Yes, uh, yes September. It, um, are they going to make any format changes on there? Are they going to have, like... Is it going to be like a? Are they pushing it towards more a variety show because it is going to be on MTV? You know, um, I, I I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. You can I, guess though. Yeah, it'd be a world of difference. Yeah. Right. But I mean, it's. Uh, but I mean, like I think the one thing that that it seems like that lacking there is, I kind of wish that they could do Sunday Night Heat like tape it on their Saturday night shows that they have, you know. You mean at a house show? Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what, it's too many days for everyone to be doing TV. I mean, they already mm -hmm. got, I don't think, I think that, like, you know, they there are offers for them to do more television mm -hmm. than they, because they're so hot right now. Right. I don't think that they want to do more than two days of television per week. Uh -huh. It's just, you know, everyone's making, I mean, if you watch those, people are already making too many mental errors, which shows that they're overworked. Uh -huh. So you re, I think all those people kind of know that, you know, <laughs> They just can't add to the the workload, uh -huh. or the production staff anymore. But it just seems think. it just seems like uh, it just seems like you know since they tape it on Tuesday before SmackDown, the, one of the reasons why you know it's losing ratings is you're not going to be able to put your top guys on there or even your, a lot of your mid card guys on there, and you've taped it. You know it's it's airing six days later. You know everybody. You know if you're on the internet, you're going to know the result. If that's even if that's the case with SmackDown. That's the case with SmackDown. SmackDown does. I mean, does fine. I mean, I don't. I don't think. I mean, when Raw used to be taped, mm -hmm. the ratings for the taped Raws were actually slightly higher than the ratings for the live Raw. So live versus taped to wrestling fans, you know, I I don't think that that's really the thing. The reason why the the heat ratings are dropping is because it's it, it went from being the B show to the C show, uh -huh. and you only you only got so many hours in your life that you want to devote watching wrestling. And and right. like with Brian and I, you know, he, you know, it's nothing against Heat. It's just that we watch so many hours of wrestling that Heat's the one that just doesn't make the cut. Right. right. You know, even though it's not the only it, one, but one of them. <laughs> and my last uh, real quick question uh, goes to uh, Mr. Morocco there. Uh, what What is your opinion as far as um, the WWF um, has been trying to go away from, you know, pile drivers and DDTs, um, stuff that would be uh, focusing on the neck, uh, a lot of neck injuries, perhaps, if it's done incorrectly? You know, they're trying to save it for um, special occasions. Uh, we're, we're totally out of time. Don, real quick, any any thought as far as, like, you know, how dangerous do you think, like, the, the DDTs off the ropes, the pile drivers, uh, dragon suplexes, and things like that? Where they, I think, you know, you know the, uh, you got to be, you know, public awareness and that we're worried about kids are going to be trying to pull these things off. Basically, bottom line. I know you're rushed for time right now. But, yeah, you, you, this is stuff you, you don't want to familiarize them with, you know, too much. The, okay, the, we, Go ahead. Yeah, we, we've, we've got to get running, Don. I want to thank you very much for doing the show. Brian, again, thanks for uh, for being here. Tomorrow we're going to have Ted DiBiase, and we'll see everyone at 6.